Hello everyone. Today I'll be giving you an introduction to chemistry. So chemistry is important because we need to know a little bit of chemistry in order to understand biochemistry, what's happening chemically in the body. So we'll go through a little bit of an introduction today to acquaint you to chemistry. So here on the first slide of our PowerPoint lectures on chemistry, I have information on what you can find within a human being, so here in this, um, in this set of rows, in terms of the content of four different elements, and they are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. You don't need to memorize these values, but I wanted you to be aware that it is these four, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, that make up most of the human body. And in fact, oxygen is at the highest percentage. Um, there is a couple of columns here where it's compared to atmosphere and the Earth's crust, but that is not important for our discussion. What is important is to know what those four elements are. Now, this makes up approximately 96 to 97 percent of the human body. So the rest of that three or four percent is made up by elements that uh, are in very small amounts and we call those trace elements. Um, so most of the human body again is made up of these four, uh, but there are other ones in small amounts like magnesium, iron, uh, zinc, all of those other elements from the periodic table that are part of the human body. If you take a look at these elements in something called the periodic table, um, you can have a look at this periodic table, which contains the, the elements, or you can find one in the appendix in your book. So this is a picture of the periodic table, and it has all of the elements that have been discovered. Um, and they're arranged based on a variety of things, including size. And so here over on the, uh, on the left hand side of this image, you can see that there's a square that contains the element symbol in the very center. In this case, uh, this is hydrogen, and it's represented by the letter H. And down here you can see the word hydrogen. And then we have a number on the top, which can be commonly found in the center or over on the left hand side, and that number on the top is called atomic number. The number directly below the element symbol is called the mass number. So we, ha we always have an atomic number and a mass number. The atomic number will never have decimal places. Uh, the mass number will. And so for solving problems involving these elements, you'll always have to round that mass number. So for instance, it's 1.01, .01, you would round to one. Uh, now the reason it's decimal, there are decimal places is because these elements can exist in different forms or isotopes, and so the average is included in this periodic table. So again, we have the chem uh, chemical symbol in the center, we have the atomic number on the top, and the mass number on the bottom. Here's an excerpt from the periodic table for carbon, represented with a C, atomic number of six, and a mass number of 12, and that's found over here on the periodic table. And again, you can see the word carbon underneath. Not every periodic table will look exactly the same. They may have different or more numbers on them, uh, or they might not have the, the name of the element spelled out, but they all should have this atomic number and this mass number. You will never need to memorize for this course what the element symbols stand for, um, or memorizing each of their atomic or mass numbers. So what is important to note is that um, all of these elements or atoms are made up of three subatomic particles. And so here there's a picture of what an idealized image of these atoms looks like. And these are the types of drawings you can find both on the internet and in your textbook or other biology or chemistry textbooks that depict these subatomic particles. The names of these particles are listed here in this table 2.2 from your book. So we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positively charged and they are found in the nucleus or the center of the atom. So if you look at this diagram, you can see the very center of it points to these two positively charged protons uh, for this particular atom. 
Uh, the neutrons, neutrons are also found in the nucleus, but they don't have a charge, they are neutral. And so these subatomic particles are also drawn in the center, and again, you don't put a charge on them. And then the last subatomic particle you can find in all atoms is the electron. And the electrons are arranged in what we call orbitals or shells that kind of span around the nucleus. And they have a negative charge. So because they are negatively charged, whereas the nucleus is overall positively charged, they remain close to the nucleus and hold together the atom in place. Um, so they are surrounding the nucleus in what we call uh, electron shells or orbitals. And again, they have that little negative charge. So this particular atom drawn here has two electrons. So the question is, how do you find the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons for any given atom? In order to find the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons for any given atom, you can look at the atomic number and the mass number. These will give you insight into those three numbers. So if you take a look at carbon, which has a 6 on the top and a 12 on the bottom, in its pure element form, right from the periodic table, um, you can see that, again, the atomic number is 6. Now the atomic number 6 represents also the number of protons in the atom. So carbon would have six protons. Now if you look at the number on the bottom, it is 12, so that's its mass number. And mass number for any element is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. You know now your number of protons is 6. So all you have to do for any atom is take 12, or the bottom number, and minus the top number from it, the atomic number. So in this case, 12 minus 6, and that should give you 6. So carbon happens to have six neutrons as well. We have six protons and six neutrons. It may not always be the case that you have the same number of protons and neutrons, just in this case we do have the same number. Now the number of electrons is actually the top number as well, the atomic number. For a pure element, that means an element taken directly from a, uh, the periodic table and not taking into account an ion. So, for non-ions, for pure elements, the top number, 6 in this case, would be the number of electrons. So for carbon, we have 6 electrons, 6 protons, and 6 neutrons. So, how we would draw that is we would have 6 protons here in the nucleus, 6 neutrons, and then we would draw our electrons in orbitals around the nucleus. Now anytime you're drawing these atoms, you would not actually have to draw all six uh, protons and all six neutrons, for example. You may just draw an arrow pointing to a nucleus and write six protons, six neutrons. Now the electrons are a little bit more complicated in terms of how you draw them. So for drawing atomic models, if we refer to the next slide, um, the electrons are drawn in electron shells. So after you draw your nucleus, which can just be a circle with an arrow pointing to it, um, and you writing however many neutrons and protons there are, you would draw the next shell around it. And in, that is called your inner shell. And that shell can only hold two electrons. So if you know, for example, carbon has six electrons, you would draw two in its inner shell, and then you would have four more electrons you need to draw. So you need to draw another sh uh, shell surrounding that inner shell, and you would add the appropriate number of electrons. So in this case we have four left, we would draw four. And you would count the number you have in that shell, which is four, plus the inner shell too, double check, that adds up to six, and you have six electrons. So these are our general rules for drawing uh, electrons um, in atoms. So again, that's for pure elements. Uh, now if you have ions, ions differ in their electron number. So you may have seen ions written before. Um, they are where you write the element symbol or name and you have a plus or a minus in the upper right corner of that element symbol. That indicates that that is an ion. Usually you'll see a plus or a plus one, or a plus two, or a plus three, and likewise a minus, or a minus one, minus two, minus three, to indicate the loss or the gain of electrons. Now, if you have a plus, that indicates that you have lost electrons. 
If you have a minus, that indicates you have gained electrons. And the number refers to how many. So if you are drawing an atom that is an ion, you would need to take into account however many electrons might be lost or gained. For example, if I had a C with a plus one charge, that would mean that I lost one electron. So if you remember back to my description of the drawing, if I had four electrons in that outer shell, then I would have to delete one if it was a, a carbon with a plus one charge. Isotopes also are drawn a little bit differently, but in this case, all you would have to change is the neutron number because the mass number changes for an isotope. So carbon can exist as an isotope called carbon-13. If you go back a couple of slides, you can see that here. This is an isotope. Um, so we can see a different mass number down here as compared to the pure element form of carbon-12 um, here. So again, that number would be rounded to 12. So because carbon exists as carbon-13, and it even exists as carbon-14, those are isotopes of carbon. So the pure element form is C12, and an isotope is C13, the 13 denoting the new mass number. So you can see that the 6 doesn't change. Uh, the atomic number never changes, so your proton number never changes. So now you have a new mass number, so 13 minus 6 gives you 7. So your new neutron number is 7. So your drawing of your atom doesn't change too much. You would just, um, where you have that arrow pointing into the nucleus, you would write seven neutrons instead of six neutrons. The electron number doesn't change for an isotope. Um, you still have six electrons. Remember, this is now different than an ion. Ions and isotopes are two different forms of the elements. So let's go through examples of drawings, and I have a couple here. So I have helium, information for he uh, from um, helium. I have an excerpt from the periodic table. Here's the chemical symbol name. Um, so helium HE, number on the top, the atomic number, and the number of the bottom, the atomic mass. So based on my information on how to find protons, neutrons, and electrons, you would start by finding uh, protons, for example. So the proton number is the top. So we have two protons for helium. Now, neutrons you find by taking the bottom number and minusing the top from it. So 4 minus 2 gives you 2 neutrons. And then the number of electrons for a pure element, remember, it's just the atomic number. So we have two electrons. So how I might draw this, and your drawings can vary based on what you learned in previous chemistry courses, if you've taken them, is I draw a circle, and that represents my nucleus. And sometimes you can even write the chemical symbol right in there. And I just draw an arrow pointing into the nucleus, and I write two protons and two neutrons. And that takes care of the protons and neutrons. Then I draw the first shell, which is the innermost shell of the atom, and I draw the number of electrons in there. Now remember that innermost shell can only hold two electrons, which is okay in this case because that's all I have to draw. So I draw my two electrons. If I had a larger atom, I would need to draw yet another shell because it would have more electrons depending on the number. Uh, and the rule for drawing electrons generally is up to eight electrons can fit into every shell following that first inner shell. So the first one can only hold two, and every shell after that will hold eight. So let's take an example of an ion. Here we have helium again, and I've given helium a minus four charge. Now that means it has gained electrons. It's more negative, and electrons are negatively charged. So that's a good way to remember um, that we, when we have a negative charge, that means more electrons. So we have gained electrons. Uh, so let's take helium from the periodic table. From the periodic table, again, we have two protons, four minus two neutrons, so two neutrons, and then we normally have two electrons. So we have two electrons normally, but we need to take into account that we have gained four. So two plus four will give us six electrons in total. So I draw the nucleus the same way, same number of protons and neutrons, two and two, and then I need to draw six electrons. So I draw two in the innermost shell, it can only hold two, so I have to draw a brand new shell following that. 
and that new shell can hold up to eight. Now I only need to add four because four plus the inner two makes six. So I've drawn enough electrons and I leave it at that. Now if you'd like to try drawing an isotope, an isotope is where we have a different mass number. So moving away from ions, here's an isotope, helium-5. And the dash and the 5 represents the new mass number. So go back to your excerpt from the periodic table and cross out the 4 mass number and give it a 5. So you're only changing the number of neutrons. So you have to go back to drawing helium from the pure element version. So meaning you have two protons. In this case, you have 5 minus 2, which gives you three neutrons. And go back to the pure element, two electrons, the upper uh, atomic number. So you draw the nucleus, two protons, and in this case, three neutrons. You draw your first shell, and you only need to draw two electrons. Remember, an isotope is not an ion. We're not changing electron number. We're changing mass and hence neutron number. So this is the way you would represent a drawing of helium-5, uh, helium so an isotope. Now atoms can bond with each other. And that's the basis for understanding how all of life's macromolecules are built. And macromolecules are things like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, things that our bodies require in order to fully function. So it's important to note how these bonds are built. And so there are really a couple different ways on how atoms can bond with each other. One way is called ionic bonding, and another way is called covalent bonding. And covalent bonding is more so um, how those macromolecules stay together in our body. So ionic bonding, first of all, is a transfer of electrons. So this is sodium over here, Na, represented as Na, and this is chlorine, represented by Cl. And the colored purple and the colored green in the center represents the nucleus, and proton and neutron number are not shown in this picture from your book. Also what's not shown is all of the um, electrons that are in between in orbitals here and here. Uh, instead, only the valence or outer shell of these two atoms is shown in this drawing. And that's because it's the valence or outer shell uh, that participates in chemical bonding. Now, an ionic bond, again, is a transfer of electrons, and it involves a metal and a nonmetal. Generally, if you go back to your picture of the periodic table, generally you're going to find your nonmetals over here and your metals over here. So sodium would be your metal, whereas chlorine, chlorine would be your nonmetal. Now, hydrogen acts as a nonmetal, so uh, when you uh, think about bonding, hydrogen participates. Um, as a non-metal. So going back, we have a metal plus a non-metal, sodium plus chlorine. And when you look and draw, and you can practice drawing this on your own, but if you actually draw out all of sodium, you see that it actually has one electron in its valence shell. Now, again, it's the outer electron that dictates how bonding will occur amongst different atoms. And when sodium comes into close contact with chlorine, what's going to happen is there's going to be an affinity for this um, electron to move to the chlorine because chlorine has seven electrons in its valence shell. And atoms are most happiest when, and most stable when they have a full set of eight electrons. So it's very easy for chlorine to just pick up an extra electron versus getting rid of seven electrons. It's less energy energetically favorable to do that. So taking one extra electron is really easy for chlorine. And sodium actually wants to donate that electron because then it would have the next shell below it, which is already full of eight electrons. So it's energetically easier just to get rid of one versus um, accepting seven whole electrons. So, sodium's really happy when it comes into contact with chlorine because it can just give away an electron and chlorine is happy to accept it. And essentially after that they become ions and hence this is an ionic bond and they'll become closely bonded together. And this is how we make salt. 
sodium plus chlorine gives you NaCl, which is salt. So sodium, because it gave up an electron, it has a plus one charge or a plus charge. And chlorine, because it accepted uh, one electron, it has a minus charge or a minus one charge. So here we see that purple electron that came from sodium that's now on chlorine. Covalent bonding, on the other hand, is sharing of electrons. So you're not directly transferring an electron to an, uh, from one atom to another. You are actually sharing electron pairs. And it involves two nonmetals. So hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen are those main four atoms that build up those large biological molecules called macromolecules in our bodies. And so those are the macromolecules that are important to sustaining our body and to carrying out daily functions. And so these are some examples of covalent bonds. Specifically, there are two types of covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar. And essentially all this means is polar is where you have unequal sharing of electrons and nonpolar is where you have equal sharing of electrons. So uh, if we take a look at the first uh, panel here, we have water as an example of a polar bond. Now, if you take a look at an oxygen atom, an oxygen atom is further on the periodic table than a hydrogen. And actually, oxygen is so large compared to hydrogen that it's going to have a very strong pull on the electrons that it's sharing with hydrogen. Now, when you look at oxygen's outermost shell, it's actually missing two electrons uh, to make a full eight. And hydrogen has one electron. So you can actually get two hydrogens, which each have one electron, and taking the place of the, and sharing the, the spots for those two electrons that are missing from oxygen. So when you put oxygen and hydrogen together, they really readily participate in this type of polar bond. And so because oxygen is so large, it'll have slightly more of a pull on those electrons, so it'll be tighter to oxygen versus the hydrogens. They'll kind of give away some of that power and strength. And so that's why you see the slightly negative and slightly positive charges uh, that are associated with this type of sharing of electrons. Other compounds and other molecules share things evenly. Um, so like carbon, for example, carbon can make four bonds because it's missing four electrons from its outermost shell. And again, hydrogen wants to make one bond, so it has a full set. Now remember, hydrogen only has one electron. So to make a full set, it doesn't require seven more. Remember, the innermost shell only needs two. So it actually, that's why it wants to make um, one bond. And so if you put four hydrogens together with carbon, uh, the, they can each bond at one spot and share a set of electrons uh, with carbon. And so this is considered an equal sharing of electrons. Another way you can get equal sharing of electrons is where you have bonding of the same sized um, atoms. So like a hydrogen with a hydrogen, they can both share a pair of electrons and they would be happy participating in that type of bond. Now again, these types of covalent bonds are really important uh, because they keep those macromolecules together. One other type of bond that's not technically a chemical bond um, is considered hydrogen bonding. Now hydrogen bonding is actually where um, two water molecules, so if we go back, two of these water molecules participate in a bond together. So here we have an oxygen with two hydrogens. Now that's one water molecule that has covalent bonding within it, but we know water molecules stick together. So this oxygen will actually form a bond, a weak attractive force with another uh, uh, with another water molecule over here if we had one. So if we drew kind of a dashed line to another water molecule, this oxygen would be weakly attracted to hydrogens coming from another water molecule. And we call those weak attractive forces hydrogen bonding. It's how water molecules stick together. So what makes water really special compared to any other liquid on the earth 
is that it can undergo hydrogen bonding. And that gives it some really important properties. So this brings it back to more of the biology understanding of chemistry. So again, these really interesting life supporting properties of water are mentioned in your book and it would be good to review um, your definitions and information on some of these. So again, these are weak attractive forces amongst molecules of water and they give water life supporting special properties. So it's why we can sustain life. If you think about your cells and cells are your basic units of life, um, all living things are made of cells. They are largely composed of water. It's where all of life's chemical reactions occur. So that's what makes water so special is the hydrogen bonding. Now, in your book, there's information on each of these points listed here. So the fact that water is polar is very special. It doesn't happen in any other type of liquid. The states of water, water can exist in three states, solid, liquid, and gas form. And that speaks to the heat of vaporization of water. So allowing water to turn into a gas form. Um, high heat capacity. So the idea that uh, it takes a lot of effort and time for water to heat. And that's important um, biologically because if you think about life living in water, so if you think about uh, aquatic environments, the fish and other life forms in the water are very resistant to changes in temperature. So that's what's happening now with global warming and global climate change is that the water is heating too quickly. And so the marine life cannot adapt to fast changing temperatures of the water. So water actually resists changes to temperature. If you try to boil a pot of water versus boiling something like a pot of oil, water takes more time to do that. It wants to resist the changes in temperature. So we call that water having a high heat capacity. So again, it's important for life because water likes to stay at a certain temperature, especially when we're sustaining life, and does not want to change temperature too quickly. And that's how life in the water had adapted. Uh, solvent properties, so the fact that water is a universal solvent, and cohesion. So water has this remarkable, remarkable, uh, remarkable ability to travel against the force of gravity. So if you think about a plant, you water the soil underneath the plant, but then water molecules are able to stick together in a cohesive property and can actually move against the force of gravity and travel up the stem to the top of the plant and nourish the plant. And so that's called cohesion. And um, water alone as a liquid has that ability to travel against the force of gravity because those water molecules are able to stick together through hydrogen bonding, it can do that. And if you've ever seen certain insects um, that have suspended themselves on top of water and are able to um, stay on top of that water without falling through, that's another uh, point about uh, water special properties due to hydrogen bonding. So that brings me to the end of our discussion on a basic introduction to chemistry. And that really uh, begins the introduction into more discussion on macromolecules and why they're important in the body and how they work, how they build themselves, and how they break down. Thank you very much.